got me and my friend had to ride in the 60s, which I thought, well, I think that's a great undervalue. Uh, the second thing he did in true situationist fashion, which he said we could do anything we like with the text. <laughs> and looking back on it now, I think maybe we should have cut them up and produced the Dada poem, which I did. <laughs> but more importantly, he made three. He made a third point, which I thought was very significant. He said that he felt, as I can say, bad. Minus is 1999. He said he felt that younger people had it worse in 1999 than when we did in 1966. That oh, okay. yeah, he's right. Yeah. Question. And that was a very gracious sort of statement. And um, I think for most of us, Chris's greatest heritage has to be this book, which people of a certain age will look back <laughs> on. And love. <laughs> and love. And I, I talk in the charts about this, and you can tell this cost me £1.25. This is such a significant book. I think for many people of um, a certain age, this is the book that kicked open the doors to so much. And it came out of the time, it was highly influential, I think for most of the people who were around at that time, everybody would admit that this, and this has to be Chrissy's great objective heritage. I mean, for other people um, who knew him, I suppose there's more subjective heritage, which they knew him as a personality, which regretfully I didn't. And um, I'm going to finish by reading two obituaries, um, just to embarrass Charles. <laughs> no, this is not, not mine. No, no, not, not yet. Um, the first picture I'm going to read is uh, um, the last few lines that Andre Breton wrote about his friend who committed suicide, suicide called Jacques Fache. And he ends up his statement with a simple statement, this man was my friend. That's Andre Breton talking about Jacques Fache. And um, this is Charles talking about Chris. He was my best friend and I love him. And I think lots of people here, not only welcome Chris, but, you know, our thoughts are with, oh, sorry, we welcome Charlie, but, you know, our memories are with Chris, and we really respect everything he did. So, over to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid that introduction was more eloquent than I can manage, but um, <laughs> uh, you, you, I, I think it, it's probably fair to start off with the rebel worker, because, I mean, that's, that's what started the whole process. For, for me, and I think probably for Chris too. Um, I, 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 in 1966, uh, Franklin and Penelope Rosemont from the Rebel Worker Group in Chicago came to visit Diana Shelley and I in, in London. And um, Diana thought we were mad, I think. Uh, <coughs> we probably were, but... Um, I became convinced at that point, I'd, I'd been through the peace movement, I'd been through the Committee of 100, and I became convinced at that point that revolution was the only answer, and that we, we needed to make an attack that was more directly onto the state than, uh, than, than anybody had attempted so far. And I, I think a lot of what we said was probably bullshit, but um, a, 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 a lot of what we said was what probably needed saying at the time. And um, Fr Franklin and Penelope were incredibly influential on me. Um, indeed, I, I, I did an anthology with Franklin on, on uh, Rebel Worker and Heat Wave uh, it, it's, it, in, the, in, in this millennium. Um, so uh, he, he was, a, Franklin particularly, was a very, very big influence on me. And I, I, I would want to pay tribute to Franklin too before I pay tribute to Chris. Um, the first issue of Heatwave emerged directly from the Rebel Work of Six, which was something that Franklin and I put together with Penelope in, in London. And with the help of Di, but the reluctant, I think probably, I'm not, I hope I'm not being unfair, but with the reluctant help of Di, because I don't think she was really into my sort of blood-curdling um, uh, anecdotes or my blood curling sort of uh, revolution happened. but it was a very exciting time and we did actually think uh, at the time that um, it was only a question of one more push and the bloody thing would fall down and uh, it didn't unfortunately but um, we, we did think that and um, anyway heatwave one was a sort of direct response to the rebel worker it was m my attempt to get something like the rebel worker going in London because Pen Penelope and Franklin left after a month in London 
and um, I had to do it on my own. And it, it was very much on my own. I mean, all the, all the, it was done by um, du duplication, and it was all it was all my own work, really. It, it, but a lot of it owed a great deal to um, Penelope and Franklin at the time. And during the during the time I was, uh, all the stencils I think were were probably just about complete. Um, and certainly the, the drafts were complete. I, I think Chris didn't really think it was theoretically competent enough. Uh, so he wasn't prepared. I mean, though I met him at the Lowen Flag um, when I was selling Rebel Work at Six, and though we became very good friends, um, he, he, he wasn't really that convinced, I don't think, by Heatwave 1. Um, he liked it, but he... he he didn't really want to put his name on it, which I don't blame him for at all, but, um, because it was, you know, it was, as I say, it was largely finished and it was largely um, my work with, with contributions from Chicago, from the Rebel Worker Group, and um, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't theoretically coherent, I should say, um, at all, but he did agree we talked a lot, and I, so I put out Rebel Worker 1, uh, the Heat Wave 1, I should say, uh, on my own. But um, by the end of Heat Wave 1, we were talking about bringing out Heat Wave 2 together. And that was when Chris really got into his own. And the All or Not At All, which uh, Malcolm has, has mentioned here, um, was really a primarily Chris's contribution to... Um, to, uh, to, to, to our joint enterprise, and um, I think Chris did bring a, a, a lot of sort of theoretical coherence because he he'd been uh, involved with uh, well more more um, directly with Sandwich's Coffee House in, in London and <coughs> with the Angry Young Men I think which is what really started him off, um, but he'd also known people in Paris, whereas I'd been sort of uh, sitting down in public places in London with Di, and I hadn't really done a, a great deal in that, that area, and my theoretical knowledge was negligible. But Franklin and Penelope brought back um, the Situationist thing on Watts, 65, which was the, I think it was called The Decline and Fall of the Spectacular Commodity Economy, which was a somewhat long-winded title, but the, the text was was very fiery and revolutionary and it didn't seem to have anything left out and uh, it, it, it certainly appealed very strongly to both to Chris and to I and uh, to me and um, we, we, we liked it a lot and Chris introduced me to uh, the, the writings of the situations which he, he was much more adept at because he spoke much better French than I did. And my French was laborious, to say the least. So, I mean, I, 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 I'd wade through... I mean, Chris would take sort of 20 minutes to read the text. I would take 20 hours to read the same text. But, um, you know, so his, 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 his uh, knowledge of French was a great deal better than mine. Um, so he, he really introduced me to the situationists broadly. And also David Arnott was another sort of um, character in, in that... Thing. Uh, David David was a funny guy. I mean, you, you know, it's it, well, it's difficult not to sort of be sort of scathing about him, really. But um, it, it's not entirely fair to be scathing about him because he, he he was quite a serious sort of person, and he he his mannerism was unfortunate. I mean, he he um, he talked very much in your face, and um, he he looked like a sort of superannuated student, and. Um, you know, I, I, I can't honestly say I really got on very well with him, but he, he'd always come out with a sort of situation of text and he'd be reading it. And and he also had quite a lot of influence on me at the time, just just by telling me what the situationist had said, because I didn't really, you know, as I say, it took me a long time to, um, to read the text, so I didn't really know what they were saying. And also, I, I never really became theoretically competent. Um, as, as my friend Stuart 
confirm. <laughs> um, uh, but um, Heatwave 2 was very definitely Chris's contribution and uh, to, 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 the, to the revolutionary thing. And we, we got a very complimentary sort of thing about Heatwave in, in, um, in the French edition of uh, the Misery and the Student Milieu. Um, which was omitted in the English translation. I, I, I suspect it. I suspect because um, by then Chris uh, had um, been joined by um, Donald Nicholson Smith and uh, Tim Clark, who were both much more intellectual than I was, and um, they they the, so the bias which in the original Heatwave. Uh, was sort of between me and Chris. I mean, one one side was intellectual and theoretical, the other side was wild and woolly, which was me, um, believe it or not. And um, so the, the balance the balance subtly changed. It was suddenly three to one instead of one to one. And um, I think I think Chris, uh, you know, probably had more in common at that point with the, the Donald Nicholson Smith, particularly, who was a uh, who'd been uh, in the French uh, group in Paris than he did with me. And, um, but we had nevertheless a very, very strong friendship, which, um, which, which was very important, I think, to both of us. And um, though we, we, we uh, I, I, I resigned from the situationist because um, I felt a a that I wasn't sort of theoretically competent to join them, um, and b because uh, I thought Guy Debord was somewhat megalomaniac to say the least, and um, and d because I, I I was facing a trial at the Old Bailey for forgery for the Committee of One Hundred at the time, and um, which was unfortunate from my point of view because I, I thought I was going to get a two-year sentence and um, in fact I, I don't think I was in danger of getting a two-year sentence but I, I did because we were charged with conspiracy, Terry Chandler and I were charged with conspiracy <coughs> and the forgery which had at the time an automatic two-year sentence. Fortunately the judge found himself minded, um, as he put it, to um, cast aside the conspiracy charge so we, you know, that, that, that took care of that. But um, by then I was, I, I think I was burnt out. I mean, Di and I had been working very hard in the um, peace movement for five or six years by then. And then I got this forgery charge, which, you know, I had really nothing to do with at all, except that I was the owner of the press that had printed it. But, um, I, I never worked in the press because um, there wasn't enough money to go around. So I mean, uh, but I was the owner. So I mean, fair enough. I, I was.